I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I just feel like God is saying Take your hands off it I have the victory Take your hands off of it Cause I've won the victory Remove your hands off of it Cause I've won the victory Release it to me i won the victory The weapon may be formed but it won't prosper and when the darkness falls, it won't breathe in. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Yes, he does. And my God will never fail. No, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, yeah.
I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the victory. The battle is his and we, uh, we win. We win. Oh, I hope that you were able to understand how much God loves you, how much he wants you to see that victorious side of your life and not live in the circumstances and that he can turn everything around, everything that's going on in your life. He can turn it around for good because it glorifies him. The Lord led me to a Proverbs 21, you know, it's the book of wisdom. Proverbs is the book of wisdom. If you want to know how to live your life as a believer, just read Proverbs. There's one for every day. Just the day of the, of the month that it is, read that proverb that day. But 21 and 31 says, do your best, prepare for the worst, then trust God to bring the victory. Do your best and trust God to bring the victory. What does that mean? It means we just don't stand there and wait for something to fall from heaven. We do our best and we believe that God, we trust that God is going to bring that victory. No matter what you're going through, God wants to see your submitted heart. God wants to see you're fully surrendered to his will and his way. Even Jesus said, not my will, your will be done. The victory is ours, church. The victory is ours. So don't live in an, a defeated life. Don't live in a place that is down and depressing and, and full of darkness. But if you're there, you can come up on out of that. That's what we're here for, to encourage you, to pray with you, to show you that God's word is powerful and it works and it will not return void. If you have a prayer request this morning, I want to pray for you right now. Those of you that are at home, I want to pray for you as well. You're going through some stuff. Some people are not here because they're compromised in their immune system. Some people's spouses or family members can't be around anybody. So we're praying for you. We're believing that God is making a way for you to, 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 to push in to the things of God. Okay, so I'm going to pray, but I also want to let you know at the end of service, if you want to come forward, our prayer team is coming. They'll be wearing masks. They have some sanitizer for you. Uh, they want to pray with you as a point of connection for maybe whatever's going on in your life. That's at the end of the service. But right now, would you extend your hands and let me pray over you at home and here in the building. Father, you know the needs of the people that are here this morning. You know those that have been living kind of in defeat or darkness depression. You know the ones that have a hard time coming up out of that, Lord. And so I pray right now the victories in you, Jesus, would be made known to them, Lord. They would see the victory in Jesus. They would see that you got everything about them. You've got that in your heart, in your hand. You're working towards a good ending for them in this situation and so I pray right now Lord God no matter what the need is Lord they would sense your presence they would turn this thing over to you so you can turn it around for good 
And Father, I pray for everybody that is, that's at home, even those that might not be feeling well. I know we got a report of a couple people that haven't been back to church yet and just got a positive uh, test result on COVID. But God, we come against that in the name of Jesus. And we ask you, Lord, to just eradicate that. Eradicate it. Keep your people safe, Lord God. Let that not uh, affect anyone. And we come against the plan of the enemy because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We give you thanks, God. We praise you, we magnify you, and we thank you, God, for what you're doing in everyone's life. Everybody said amen. Now let's continue. Come on, continue to worship. Continue, continue to push in. See, the enemy wants some of us to just lay back and watch. But I sense in my spirit, even in first service, time for some of you to press in to push beyond watching and allow the Holy Spirit to move in your heart maybe you can't even say the words maybe all you can do is raise up your hands but please let the Holy Spirit minister to you please push into the things that God has for you amen come on let's let's continue to worship team let's really give it all that we've got in Jesus name I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Open our eyes, God, so we can see what you're doing. Open our eyes, God, so we can know what you're doing on the unknown. Open our eyes, God, so we can see what you're doing beyond the unseen. Open our ears, Lord. So we can hear what you're saying beyond the unheard. Open our eyes, Lord, so we can see what you're doing beyond the unseen. Open our eyes, Lord, so we can see. What you're doing beyond the unseen Open our eyes, Lord, so we can see What you're doing beyond the unseen Open our ears, Lord, so we can hear What you're saying When I 
it's not just what you do. You don't just give us faithfulness. You don't just give us grace. You don't just give us love, but it's who you are. Your character never changes, God, and we are so thankful for that. Thank you for reminding us of who you are this morning, that your character stands the test of time. Nations rise, nations fall, but you still stand. And we thank you for that this morning, God. If you believe that and you're thankful for that, would you just give him a hand clap, raise your hands to him, tell him hallelujah, tell him thank you. You're my God. What shall I fear? Nothing, nothing will I fear because you are my God. Amen? Amen. Well, before you take a seat, why don't you turn around to a few of your neighbors, give them an air five, an air hug, thumbs up, give them a smile, tell them you're so glad to see them, and uh, have a seat. All right, Father's house. Man, we're growing, we're coming back. How many of you excited to be in the house this morning? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah, it's such a blessing to be able to come and fellowship with those in the body, isn't it? My name is Eddie. I'm part of the School of Ministry here at the Father's House. And welcome, welcome online guests as well. Uh, we love that you're here and joining in. And um, thank you for your faithfulness, faithfulness in giving. Paul wrote to the church, early church, in a letter to the Corinthians that if the intention and desire are there, the size of the gift doesn't matter. Your gift is fully acceptable to God according to what you have, not what you don't. So if in your hand you have a tool, you have a hammer or a screwdriver, and in the other hand you don't, you're going to use that tool. You're going to use that method. So as you're giving this morning, you've got some different ways that you can give. You can give online at thefathershouse.com forward slash give. Um, in the seat back pockets in front of you, you can uh, mail those in or you can drop them in the generosity buckets here as you leave today. And then you can also text giving to 352-329-2301. So about that tool that you have, it's not about what's in the other hand that you don't. Use what God is giving you to bless others and be generous. And the reward that you get will be immensely more. Amen. How many of you are so excited for part four of the end zone? I know I am. Here it comes. I'll get up and do like an end zone dance. How about that? Maybe the last one, uh, get ready for next week. You can do an end zone dance and uh, see who's the most creative one coming up. I've been loving this series. Next week will be the end of this series. Next week, I'm going to talk about the new heaven, the new earth. Uh, and uh, I think there'll be some things that you find very interesting and some things we haven't, maybe you've never heard before. And looking forward to that. Well, if you have your Bible, you have your uh, uh, iPad, your iPhone, whatever you have, your Android, your Abacus, whatever you have, let's hold it up. <laughs> Abracadabra in the mind. All right, let's make a confession. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It is life to me. Today I receive the Word. I confess my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, I am obedient, and I will never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen. Father God, we come to you today, and we're just so thankful for your presence. Your presence is here, and um, we, 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 just, we just can't tell you enough how much that we love you, and uh, we're looking for a miracle, and we're going to have some miracles Thank you for the miracles that you've given in this 21 days of fasting and prayer and seeking you. Now, Lord, as we come to this teaching today, we ask you to help us to see things maybe we've never seen before. Give us understanding. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would anoint me because without you, I can really say nothing that will be of any meaningful impact in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today, as we move into this, and let me just say, if you've missed any of this End Zone series, we talked last week about um, the different crowns that are giving out, the different rewards. We talked about when is the Lord coming back. We talked about different views. Uh, will it be a pre-trib, mid-trib, uh, uh, post-trib? We just said we believe it'll be pan-trib. It'll all pan out, right? I gave you a lot of resources. Remember, I said in, in, 
in uh, essentials, we must have unity. Essentials. Uh, the Trinity, that's an essential. Uh, salvation only through Jesus Christ is an essential. Uh, a non-essential is, uh, and an essential is he's coming back. A non-essential would be, when is he coming back? How is he coming back? And so in that, we say in essentials, we have unity. In non-essentials, we have love, charity, acceptance, and patience, right? So today, we're going to talk about what happens after the end zone. Yeah. What happens the minute after you die? What happens one minute after you die? Well, studying uh, every major religion, I've come up with seven options that happens immediately after you die. First of all, nothing. Nothing happens. That's what the atheists and the agnostics say. They say if you die, they're going to put you in the dirt, burn you, whatever, and that's it. That's kind of hopeless, I think. Or you return. You die and you return. The Hindus, the New Agers, some of the Scientologists, some of the Eastern mystic religions say, uh, you, if you do good in this world, you come back maybe one level higher. In the old world, if you, uh, if previous world, if you were a bad butterfly, maybe you come back as a woolly worm in the next one. I don't know. Or you did good, you come back maybe as a, 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 some, something else. And so it's just that constant thing. Um, a third thing you can do is discover nothing Ness, nothingness. That's a tough one. Nothingness. Uh, those who embrace reincarnation say, if you countless keep coming back and coming back reincarnation, you'll eventually get to a state of nirvana. Nirvana is the absence of pain and the absence of self. It's really not like you get to Nirvanaville. It's just, it just simply means you get to a state of nothing. Nothing. Nothing is going on. Or, get this one, you can return to space after you die. Scientology friends believe in the reincarnation that re you are a reincarnated alien. That you came to this earth, your ancestors, millions of years ago. Hubbard, in his writings, talks about the process of Thetan, which is a code word for space alien that will be released back into space after you have qualified through the different stages. Hmm, there you go. Or number five, you can enter limbo. A lot of Catholics believe this, believe purgatory, that it's a temporary place and you got to pray, you got to give to get me out of purgatory. Some people believe it's soul slumber. Once you die, your spirit stays with your body until the resurrection. But Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, right? Or number six, you can arrive in hell. Three of the top five religions believe that, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, that if you reject the Lord, if you reject the way of salvation, then when the moment, at the minute after you die, you'll wake up in hell. That's, that's exactly where you go. You won't pass go, get $200, but you'll go straight to hell. And uh, hell was never created for you. Hell was created for Satan and his angels to, because they had to pay for their rebellion and their sin. But if you choose not to accept Jesus' payment, then you go to hell to pay your own payment because somebody has to pay for your sins. Or number seven, which I hope we all will choose, is we want to arrive in heaven. How many of you want that one? That's what I want to do the minute after I die. But let me say this. After Christ's coming, we started talking about this last week, whether he sets up his reign for a thousand years, and it's at, at the culmination of everything, there are two judgments, two judgments. Everybody here today is going to stand in one of those judgments, not both. You're going to stand in one of those judgments. Uh, Hebrews 9 and 27, would you read it with me? Every human heart is appointed to die once. Let's read again. Ready, go. Every human heart is appointed to die once and then to face God's judgment. You will die. Everyone in here, unless the rapture happens before you die, you will die, and then you will face God's judgment. The end of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament said this, God will bring every act to judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. In other words, he's more than an all-seeing eye. He sees all of it, and he keeps a record of it. So after the end zone, you will face, everybody in here will face one of two judgments. It won't be billions of people, and then the Lord gets up there and says, okay, well, y'all did good. 
And somebody in the back says, what did he say? He said he needs some more wood. No, it's not that, all right? It's, it's you as an individual. He's going to look at you, and you're going to look at him, and you will be judged for your life. The judgment seat of Christ is the first judgment we want to talk about, and it's the Bema seat. It's a seat where the, where the king would sit, and he would give out rewards to runners or to warriors who would come back in. So the judgment seat of Christ that we, we as Christians, if the Lord has forgiven us of our sins, I'm not judged for my sins. Jesus has already been judged for my sins. But when I invite Christ into my life, my destiny, my judgment is set, and I'm going to go to the judgment seat of Christ. And it's a judgment seat in which that he's going to give out thank yous. He's going to give out rewards for how you've been faithful in this life. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10. So whether we live or die, we make it our life's passion to live our lives pleasing to him. For one day, we will all be openly revealed. That means every motive that we've had will be open to Christ on his throne. So that each of us will be duly recompensed for our actions done in life, whether good or worthless. We said last week, and this was a good one, let's say it together, remember Belief determines where we spend eternity, and our behavior determines how. My belief, if I believe in Jesus, then my eternity is I'm going to spend eternity with him on the new heaven and the new earth. If I say, no, I don't believe in you, Jesus. You're a good man, but I'll take care of my own sins. I don't need you in my life. I'll handle it. I don't need anybody telling me what to do. Then my eternity has been decided. I have decided myself that I will spend eternity separated from God. In this world, God will do everything he can to gather us to him so that we are partners with him. But if you keep rejecting and rejecting and rejecting, there'll be a day that you die or at the end of that, and your choice of rejecting him has determined your eternity. But our behavior determines how we will spend eternity. I said last week, not everybody's going to get equal rewards in heaven. Heaven is not a socialistic country. Heaven, we will be rewarded according to our works. Hell, hell, people in hell will receive different levels of punishment. I'm not saying there's different levels of hell. I don't know how all that fits. But I do know there will be different levels of punishment uh, in hell. I just... Just being there would be a punishment enough, right? People say, well, I'll just partner, party with my friends. We'll party. No, you won't. Hell is a place of total separation. Not only separated from God, but you're going to be separated from everyone else. And a place of darkness and a place of intense pain forever and ever and ever and ever. I was, uh, in between services, I was praying, and the Lord reminded me of Matthew 7 and 15. Uh, and I'm going to read it to you from the Passion, Matthew 7 and 15. It won't be on the screen, so you have to listen. Jesus is talking to churchgoers. He's talking to people. You see, my, my, my hurt is I believe there are people sitting in churches today all over the world that are lost. They've said, mumbled a prayer, but they've never had a heart change. Their life is not following after the Lord. There's no fruit. But they think that just because they mumbled a prayer didn't make a life change, that they're going to spend eternity in heaven. But listen to what Jesus says here. Constantly be on guard against phony prophets. They come disguised as lambs, appearing to be genuine on the inside, but they're like wild, ravenous wolves. You can spot them by their actions, for the fruits of their character will be obvious. You won't find sweet grapes hanging on a thorn bush, and you'll never pick good fruit from tumbleweed. So if a tree is good, listen, it will produce good fruit. But if a tree is bad, it will bear rotten fruit, and it deserves to be cut down. Look at the obvious fruit of their lives and ministries, and then you'll know whether or not they're true or false. Listen to what these people say. Don't judge me. Jesus just said, I can judge you whether or not that you're a Christ follower by the fruit that's in your life. You say, well, I don't like that. I like this thing that I pray a little prayer and I'm, I'm, everything's taken care of. So you're saying that if you pray a prayer with your mouth and your brain, but it doesn't affect your life, that you're all right? Here's what Jesus says to that. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the realm of heaven's kingdom. It's only those who persist in doing the will of my heavenly Father. 
On the day of judgment, many will say, Lord, don't you remember? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons and do many miracles for the sake of your name? But I'll say to them, go away from me, you lawless rebels. I have never been joined with you. You said words, but we were never joined together. That would be like me saying to my wife, uh, all the years that ago that we were married, stand there and say, I love you. I'll always be with you. And then we never had a relationship. We never had a, a, an understanding. She lived her life. I lived my life. But yet we're married, but we have no relationship. And that's what Jesus says. He said there are people that took out fire insurance, prayed a prayer to get guilt off of them, and they never changed their life. They never bear fruit. You see, it's not the fruit that gets me to heaven. It's the fruit that tells me whether or not that I have a relationship with the Lord. And then the fruit that I produce affects my standing with him in eternity. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, Matthew 16 and 27 says, for the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and he'll repay each person according to what he has done. Paul gets more specific about this. He says, on the day of judgment, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. You see, there are a lot of people who serve God and have gifts, and they use those gifts, but they use them for their own glory. They want to be seen. You know, they, I, I've, I've seen, I, I, I've been to places where when preachers preach, they want everybody to take notes, they want everybody to watch, and then when they go to a conference, they sit back, never take notes, and never even carry the Bible. You see, when they're in charge, and it's theirs, they're ready to give it all there is. We've had people like that on the stage. They told Andrea, said, well, if you'll let me sing that solo, or if you'll do it this way that, you, that I want, or this, then I'll, I'll do that. You see, they can then do it, but guess what? They've lost their reward. There's no reward in that. The reward is wherever God plays places me, I am faithful until he does something else in my life. Look at this is what it says here. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives after he judges it. So in other words, he's saying today, Terry, I'm going to judge this teaching that you're teaching. It's not by how many amens you get. It's not by how many people say, oh, I like that and how many tweetable things they put. But I will judge you according to what I put in you and what my word says. And you're going to be judged for the motive. Was your heart right? Did you get up here just to be seen? There are a lot of churches, a lot of pastors, a lot of worship teams. They just get up to be seen. And it's all about them being seen. Well, he says, yes, but your, your act is going to be judged by the fire of God. Look at this. But if the work is built, burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but it'll be like somebody barely escaping the walls of flames. He said, yeah, you'll make it to heaven, but you did everything for yourself. You did everything only to please you. It's like, you know, it's, it's your world and we get to live in it. You ever met anybody like that? It's quiet, but you know what I'm talking about. You I saw you somebody cut your eyes over. Stop that. <laughs> it's gonna, we're going to be amazed when we get to heaven to see who's going to get the big rewards. See, some of you that don't make a big splash out in public, the Lord has seen everything you've done for years. He's seen your faithfulness. He's seen your faithfulness when it was not easy. And he's going to reward you. Not according to you just showed up but he's going to reward you because of your motive. I'm doing it because I know he gifted me, and I'm going to give him my very best. The second judgment is a great white throne judgment, and I hope nobody here today will be at this one because this is for unbelievers. Revelation 20, 11 through 15, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, because unbelievers don't want to look into the face of God. And there was found no place for them, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were open, and another book was open. He said, there's, there's a stack of books. That's going to be the works that you have done as an unbeliever, the evil that you've done. And he said, there's another book called the book of life. And if your name wasn't in the book of life, then he shut that book, and he turned to the books, which have a listing of every wrong you've ever done. He said, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It's just the same as, as believers 
are blessed and rewarded according to their works, unbelievers are going to be punished to the level of their unbelief. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 11. But I say to you, it would have been more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment. It will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon. So that means if it's more tolerable, then for others it's going to be what? Less tolerable. So there's a difference in the punishment. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Jesus says to those people that he walked among them and did miracles. He said, everything that I've done among you, if I did those works or even part of them in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented and Sodom would still be standing today because Jesus knows the hearts of individuals. But he said, all these works I've done and you've kept rejecting me, so your punishment is going to be bigger even those in Sodom because they didn't see me. They knew that the Messiah would come, but they didn't see me. So I'm telling you today, it's not good news. You're here and if you reject the word. Because he says, to whom much is given, much is required. So if you hear today me saying there's two judgments, you can't say, oh, gosh, golly gee, I, I didn't know it was going to happen. No, you're going to be held accountable. And so when you hear me say you're going to be rewarded as a believer according to your works that you have with the right motives, you can't say, oh, but I did this and I did that and I did something else. No, it's according to our works. Our destiny is settled by our belief, but how, how we work is going to depend on the benefits that we have. Romans 2, 5 and 6 says, but because of your calloused heart and refusal to change direction, you're piling up for yourself wrath in that day when God's judgment is revealed, for he will give to each one in return for what he has done. So he said, if you, compl if you continue to rebel and rebel, and re you're piling up wrath. In other words, your punishment is going to be worse than others. Heaven is not the default. We live in a world today in which that I think that we've come to this, we just, this, I don't know what it is. It's just kind of like a, a, a place that we've got into, this bubble, like, well, you know, it's going to be all right. Everybody, you know, is going to get to heaven. Everybody's going to see Jesus. And if, if that were true, Jesus died in vain. The pain and the punishment was on his back in vain. It's not, heaven is not the default. Hell is the default. You've heard people say, well, you know, Uncle Billy Bob died, and Uncle Billy Bob's in a better place. You know, he never had much for Jesus and didn't have much for church. No, he's not in a better place. Listen to me. He's not in a better place if he never invited Christ into his heart. We've got to wake up as a church and wake up as individuals that people's lives are, are, are decided in the decisions that they make. So you say, okay, well, what, what's my next steps? How, what, what should I do? Well, here it is. First one is, Repent of your sin with urgency. Repent of your sin with urgency. If you've never invited Christ into your heart, or if, if you mumbled a prayer years ago, but your life hasn't changed, your heart is not after Jesus. I mean, you think about Jesus when you're in a need, or you think about Jesus on Sundays, but the rest of the week, you, you don't have any thoughts about him. And then you play around with sin. Listen to me. Listen to me today. Repent of sin with urgency. If you're an unbeliever today, listen, I, I beg you, I beg you in, in every way that I can not to leave this service today unless you know without a shadow of a doubt that if you were to die today and you would wake up in the next minute that you would be in the presence of the Lord. Don't mess it up. Don't blow that. Don't say, well, next week I'll make a change or I'll make some other time. No, it's today. Repent of sin with urgency. And second of all, if you're a Christian, don't play with sin. Don't say, how close can I get and still be all right? Oh. Excuse me. I found a flat Jesus. All right. Flat Jesus was worshiping with us today. Now I'm going to let flat Jesus uh, teach with me today. It's a long story. You have to go online and see some of those things, all right? Not flat Stanley, but flat Jesus. How many of you know flat Stanley? Okay. All the kids know flat Stanley, all right? And, uh, but we have a flat Jesus. You should, you should know Jesus. He's not always flat. 
Proclaim, here's the next one, proclaim the gospel with urgency. Proclaim the gospel with urgency. You believe in heaven, right? You believe that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven? Then who have you, with urgency, told about the Lord? Or at least just said to them, Jesus loves you. Some of you go home and you have kids that are lost. Some of you have parents and relatives that show up on Sundays for lunch or you go out. And you never say anything to them about Jesus. And I know what we think. Well, I don't want to, I don't want to pester them. I don't want to pester them. You know, nobody can be pestered into the kingdom of God. Nobody can be negatized into the kingdom of God. You don't, you don't reach people by saying you're a horrible sinner, you're a horrible sinner, you're a horrible sinner. They know that. But for us to go on continually and continually and never say anything to our kids, you say, well, I, I, don't, I just don't want to bug them. I wonder how much of a bug it would be on the day of judgment when you make it to heaven and they're separated into an eternity separated from God. Then will you feel bad that you bug them? I'm going to tell you, every opportunity that you have, you need to look at them and simply say, I love you with everything I have and God loves you with everything he has and he has a heart for you and he's never given up on you. Every chance you get, you need to say that. You need to let people know that. That's witnessing. That's sharing. That's opening up the door. One of the ways that we do that is to help people is we have these little cards. And uh, I, I give out these cards from time to time. And this one says, you're invited. We don't care where you've been. We just care where you're going, the Father's house. And just simply I'll say to somebody, hey, I don't know if you've got a, a, a church that you go to. We went to get some carpet this week. I said to the guy, hey, I don't know if you uh, have a home church or not, but we sure would love for you to come hang out with us at the Father's house. Just a bunch of losers who've been saved, a bunch of people who are sinners and have been saved by the Lord's grace, and now we're no longer losers, but we are winners in Jesus' name. Here's another card we use. This, is, this says something extra to show God loves you. And uh, we include this with, with a tip. We have a lot of these cards outside. You can get them as you leave. Because some of you who feel like you're never really good at witnessing to people, you can use these cards. So you wrap a good tip around it. And when the waiter comes by, you hand it to him and say, you know what? You did a great job today. And I just want you to know that, that God loves you. And he's got a great plan for your life. And hey, if you've got any questions, on the back of this card, there's truelife.org. And those are free video answers to life's hardest questions. Maybe I, we don't have time to answer your questions, but maybe you wonder, how can I be saved? Uh, you know, what is heaven like? Uh, what is healing? Why, why is there evil in the world? And so it's little quick things on, on truelife.org uh, that answers those. So, you know, sometimes you wonder, well, how can I witness to a Muslim? Or how can I witness? Or what is this? And on there, there are people who've been delivered from that area, and there's testimonies. So we have all these to help you. You say, but yeah, but I, I don't know if, it, if their life was changed. But yet, what if you planted a seed, and then somebody else comes along next week and says, hey, I want you to know God loves you. And all of a sudden, they begin to think, you know what? God might love me. I, I thought he didn't care for me, but God might love me. Folks, We've got to get urgent. We've got to get urgent about proclaiming this gospel of Jesus Christ and not let our loved ones die and go to hell. And then, then we need to build our life, build our life on things that last forever. What is it that you like more than anything else and you wanted so much? Guess what? When the end of this world comes, it's going to be burned up. Ed, all those beautiful cars you've got, man, all those wonderful cars, you spend a lot of time. They're going to just burn up. Yeah. Mike, your motorcycle's going to burn up, son. It's just going to go up in flames. That new five-string bass guitar you got, it's just going to burn. It's just going to go up. That drum set you got, it's just going to go up. But I'm going to tell you won't, what won't burn up. Your life and what you've invested in Jesus. When you get to heaven, oh, wow. The things that you enjoyed here, you're going to only be intensified by enjoying them there. What an awesome, awesome thought. So I'm going to encourage you. You need to spend and sacrifice your resources on that which brings eternal reward. Life is stewardship. He says to us, I want you to steward what I've given you. I want you to be a good manager. So he says, I'm giving you a body. And then as a believer, this body becomes the temple 
of the Holy Spirit. So God says, I want you to be a good steward. Eat good stuff. Exercise. Renew your mind. Don't just veg out all the time. You know, don't become a gospel blimp. Do something, all right? You know, everybody won't be Barbie. In last service, somebody had a Barbie Bible. Have you seen that Barbie Bible? Not really. But taking care of our body. Say, well, when I get to heaven, I'll have a glorified body. Well, what if it looks just like your body you got now? But it's in a different state. Steward of what he gives us. He gives you a gift. Some of you have a musical gift. Some of you have a worship gift. Some of you have a teaching gift. Some of you have a service gift. Some of you, uh, are the people who make the grounds look so good and, and do all that in the rain, the sunshine, and everything else. Are you using that gift for its kingdom? Well, I would, you know, if they'd do it how I wanted to do it. No, 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 no. Then you just lost your reward even if you did it. You just offer it to God. You offer it to Him with the heart. What about your, what about your wallet? What about those reasons? Here, here's an interesting scripture. Lay up treasures for yourself in heaven. How do I do that? I do that through the tithe and through giving. Lay up treasures in heaven. He doesn't say lay up treasures in the Father's house, but he simply says something transactional happens when you present the tithe to the church and the offering. He said you lay up. So I'm, I was thinking about this. And I've been a tither, a faithful, consistent tither, since I was seven or eight. So that means when I mowed yards and I'd get two bucks, I'd take 20 cents. We didn't give online back then. <laughs> I don't even know that we had envelopes. We just, I just put 20 cents away. Don't tell me you're a good steward of the resources God gives you and you're wanting him to give you more if you're not willing to give him the tithe on two bucks. So I started at seven. I was thinking, Tim, all of that I have given since seven, and now I'm 70, and if the heavenly interest rate accrues at God's status, whew, I'm wealthy. When we get to heaven, and you don't have any resources because you've been so chintzy, and spending it all on yourself and things that's going to burn up, if you come by, I might give you a dollar. <laughs> Think about that. Some of you who feel like that you're right at poverty level, but you have been faithful in tithing and giving of what God has put into you, and on that day, you're going to get there, and he's going to say, this is what you sent ahead of you. But I know a lot of other Christians, they don't send anything ahead, and they're going to get there and say, well, why do they have it? Because what you did here affects what you do there. Does that make sense? Good stewards, good stewards. And here's the last thing I want to say today. It's my favorite. Remember, this world is not our home. This world is not our home. It's coming apart. Wow. He said, I'm going away to prepare you a place. Can you imagine what that place is going to be like? I'm going to talk a little about that next week. You don't want to miss that. I want to, here's what I want to do the rest of my life. I want to make the new heaven and the new earth so real and so appealing that we can't wait to get there. That we can't wait to get there. And I want to make hell so real that people will know how much that we love them and care for them. Uh, what a tragic day. Look at this quote. What a tragic day of regret to stand before Jesus, the lover of your soul, and realize you squandered the one and only life you had here on earth. You ever squandered something? You ever squandered money? Squander on something, then you say, where's your money? Or did you get your money's worth? No. But that right there motivates me. Standing before the lover of my soul, barely making it into heaven, he said to the person who had gave out gifts and he said I'm going to go away I'm going to come back and see how you do with those gifts one person doubled their gifts the other person doubled their gifts and he said well done I'm going to make you ruler over ten cities in my new Jerusalem in my new heavenly and the person had one said well I was afraid I didn't really do anything with it 
He's going to say, you wicked servant. Let me take back your talent. I'm going to give it to somebody else. So Matt, you better keep picking that guitar because I'm telling the Lord, if, if you don't use that for him, take that talent away from you and give it to me. How's that? How's that? And I'll give you my guitar. I'll give you my accordion playing uh, to you. Comes back to what they said last week in the Gladiator movie that we watched part of. Maximus said this. What we do in this life echoes in eternity. Let's, let's pray. Father, we come to you right now and it's a, it's a sobering moment when we think about that how we live now affects our eternity and the belief that we have now determines our eternity. Father, would you wake us up as a church? Forgive us of our unconcern for the lost. Forgive us for just sort of thinking everybody's going to make it. And Lord, we don't want to be... Uh, we don't want to be people who make people feel bad, but in a world that has no hope, we want to be people who make people feel hope. Forgive us, Lord, for not being compassionate. When we see people lost in our own family or those that work with us and those in our sphere of influence, would you break our heart with what breaks your heart, the lost? You looked over the city of Jerusalem and you wept because they were rejecting the only hope, and that was you. Lord, at the Father's house, break our heart with the lost. And Father, for every believer that's here today, would you remind us again what we do with the stewardship of our time, our talent, and our treasury affects our eternity. With every head still bowed and every eye praying, every eye closed and every head bowed, if you're here today and you're not sure, without a shadow of a doubt, you're not sure today that you're ready to meet the Lord, or you're watching online and you'd say, I, I, I'm not sure, Terry. I want to lead you in a prayer in just a minute, but I want to lead you in a prayer just with words. I want to lead you in a prayer that changes your heart's desire. So if you're in the house or you're watching online and you say, you know, I'm just not sure that I'm ready to meet Jesus. You know what? Maybe you've gone to church all your life. Maybe you've even done things in church, but you're just not sure. You don't have that assurance. Please don't leave. Please, please, I, I beg of you, please don't leave without that assurance today. So if that's you in the house or online, would you raise your hand and say, Terry, would you include me in this prayer? Include me in this prayer today. Thank you. Just raise your hand. Yes, include me in this prayer. Those of you that are watching online, today's the day I want to be included in this prayer. I want to know without a shadow of a doubt, without a shadow of a doubt, that I'm ready. Let me lead you in a prayer. Father God, thank you for your son Jesus dying for my sins. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your spirit. And as best as I know how, I'm going to serve you all the days of my life. Listen, if you prayed that prayer with me today, text DECIDED to 352-329-2301. We, want, we have a book that we want to give you. It's called Now What? It's now that you've prayed that prayer, then what are the actions? What do you need to be working on? It's a great book. And if you need that, you're in the house today and you prayed that prayer, you can also get that out at the next steps table. And then as you leave today, at each of the doors, there will be some ushers there with the uh, generosity bucket. You can drop in your tithe, your offering. I know maybe you haven't been coming to church and you give when you're here. So let me encourage you to be sure you do that. And if you haven't been doing that, let me sure you get caught up because you're going to need the Lord. You're going to need his help. And so we sow a seed, we reap a harvest. And uh, if you're a first-time guest today, we're so blessed that you're here. If you'll take your connection card and go out to the balloon table, I have a book that I want to give you. Thanks for coming today. Would you stand? Let me pray a blessing over you. Thank you so much for coming today. God bless you. God bless you. So remember, this is what we're going to do this week. 
We're going to do it. Say it with me. Leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus. And here's how we're going to do that. We're going to love God, help people, and build the kingdom. The prayer team is coming down front and positioning themselves. If you'd like prayer before you leave today, they'll be wearing masks and practice social distancing. But they want to pray with you. We don't want you to leave today saying, I wish I'd had somebody to pray for me with the need that I have today. So after I release this blessing, you'll be free to come down. You'll be free to leave. Let me, would you lift your hands? Let me pray for you. I bless you today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I bless you going out, and I bless you coming in. I bless the new steps that you take this week. I bless you with the Father's blessing that you're never alone. I bless you today with peace. I bless you with the assurance that your eternity is settled if you're a Christ follower and you're living a life full of his grace. And I bless you. Go in the peace of Jesus. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Appreciate you being here today.